It's my great honor to introduce our third keynote speaker of the symposium, which is Professor Stephen Webb. Uh, Stephen Webb has his undergraduate physics degree from the University of Bristol and a PhD in physics from the University of Manchester, and he's now located at the University of Plymouth in southern England. In addition to his scientific contribution in physics, uh, Stephen's been a prolific author of books, popularizations, uh, covering different aspects of physics and astrophysics. His most recent book is called Around the World in 80 Ways, which I think was as much work to make the figures for as it was to write. So it's sort of an interesting way to visualize data about our world. Uh, so that's his latest work. But the book that makes him of keen interest to our community is a book that was published in 2002 called if the universe is teeming with aliens, where is everybody? Uh, 50 solutions to the Fermi paradox. So rather than trying to propose a novel solution to the Fermi paradox, what Stephen did was an exhaustive cataloging and organization of all the different solutions that had been proposed to the Fermi paradox. And this book attracted quite a bit of attention. Uh, I think he did a TED talk as a result of this. And based off the feedback that he got, people writing in, have you thought about this? Did you consider that? In 2015, he brought out a second edition of the book. If the universe is teeming with everybody, where are, where are if the universe is teeming with aliens, where is everybody? 75 solutions to the Fermi paradox. So uh, I, I think this is someone whose uh, opinions on the, the feasibility of interstellar flight is someone we should, we should be listening to. So I think uh, it's very appropriate he's come here to give us our, our keynote address this morning. So Stephen. This good? This good? About here? Yeah. Thanks for that warm welcome, Andrew. Um, I'm up to about 85 or 90 solutions now. Don't really want to publish a book called 100 Solutions, but if anyone's got any new ones, please let me know at the end, and uh, I'll consider it. Um, I'm not going to talk much about different solutions uh, this morning. I want to talk about some discussions I've had with philosophers about the Fermi paradox, and I'll consider one in, in particular. And I want to talk about some conversations I've had with SETI scientists in the UK, and I'll link those two things together at the end. I might take a rather convoluted approach, but I will get there eventually, believe me. Before I begin, though, can I just say how refreshing this symposium has been, well, at least for me? Um, because for a lot of people, space is just the day job. Okay, at my institution, it's Portsmouth, not Plymouth. You must never, never say that if you're in the UK. It's massive rivalry. Um, but we're, we're developing um, space engineering courses. And the reason we're doing that is that space is a large part of the local economy. And the companies involved in that area, they're finding that their, techno their technicians, their engineers, their scientists, they're getting old like me and they're retiring. And we haven't been replacing people at the right rate. And that's going to throttle economic activity uh, fairly soon. So we're creating space engineering courses to address a problem that's been building for years, and we hope to get a payoff in the next four or five years. So space is the here and now. It's the day job, it's the mundane, it's the quotidian. And I think it's really important for a community like this just to look at longer time horizons. And that's why I find this so refreshing. And I will be looking at some quite long time horizons in this talk. Not as long as Frank Tipler's, but still quite long. So, given that it's a long way away, interstellar flight, we have to ask, I think, is it possible? 
and opinions do vary, as we know. So I'm not on Twitter much anymore. My, my blood pressure just couldn't stand it. But occasionally things leak through to where I'm currently living. And I saw this a few months ago from an Anurag Joshi. We aren't leaving this solar system. Even reaching Oort's cloud would be monumental. Proxima next to impossible. Fairly uncompromising. The good people at McGill responded, I think, with just the right amount of peeve. Uh, half a dozen technologies that are, are feasible, surely. Fission, fusion, light sails. We've looked at that over the, next, uh, over the past few days. Are you certain that all of these are unfeasible? And, and why that huge disagreement? And I think in part it's a disagreement over timescales again and personal experience and the experience of our parents and our grandparents is very different. And if you look at my granddad, or, or no, let, let, let's look at Fermi. They were born at around about the same time. Fermi, he was born when humanity was literally a terrestrial species, you know, linked to the ground. I suppose you could get up in the air in a balloon, but it was before Kitty Hawk, okay? He lived to see humanity become a spacefaring civilization, loosely defined, if you define it as reaching the Kármán line. And he died young, and as you get older, you realize how young he died. But had he lived to be an average age, he would have seen Voyager launch. And had he lived to be an old man, he would have seen us become an interstellar species. Again, very loosely defined, if you call that as reaching the heliopause. And that's astonishing, isn't it? For one lifespan to go from a terrestrial species to an interstellar species, loosely defined. And, and, and people did experience that in single lifespans. It's astonishing. But Anurag, he's seen none of that. Okay, he's heard that humans set foot on the moon. If he spends any time on Twitter, he'll come across conspiracy theories that say that's all a hoax. Blood pressure, you know. Um, but what he has seen is spectacular progress in computing and in certain metrics associated with biotechnology. And I, I won't take this thought any further, but maybe you need um, developments in all three fields for interstellar travel, computing, biotechnology, and the propulsion aspect. What I would argue, though, is that all of this is the wrong framework in which to be thinking about interstellar travel anyway. Individual lifespans are not the right framework to be thinking about this. I think we need to adopt a Stapledonian mindset. Uh, for those of you who haven't come across Olaf Stapledon, he was a, a, a British philosopher active about 90 years ago. And he was interested in what might humanity become? You know, how might we um, develop? How might we disturb the universe? And it's, it's talking about long time scales. And this brings into play what you might call uh, exploratory engineering. You know, not what we can do right now, but what we might be able to achieve subject to the laws of physics in the future. And that brings in lots of he words, what's possible, plausible, probable. And in this Stapledonian mindset, we're not interested in that projected future or even the probable future, perhaps not even that plausible future, but what's, what's possible, what might happen. It's to try and free the mind into to thinking what is possible subject to the laws of physics. I'd argue that we don't spend enough time thinking about where we want to end up, what's preferable. A Boolean approach would suggest that what's outside of that cone is impossible. I, I think that I, I, I've, I've realized over the past few days that we all draw the width of this cone in different places. Um, so I'm not gonna say what's outside is impossible, but a, another P word, let's call it preposterous, okay? 
And I, I want to give an example of where I would draw the lines between possible and preposterous. We've looked at warp drives already. Um, it, it feels as if it's a, a technology that should work. It should get us to the stars faster than light, yeah? And that's because of Star Trek and all the science fiction that we've read. It, it sounds plausible. It feels right. But what does it actually mean? And there are serious scientific discussions about warp drives, a lot of which takes place in a journal called Classical and Quantum Gravity, for which I have a soft spot because that was my first job working on that journal a long time ago. And we've already come across the Alcubierre drive. This is what started it all. Uh, Miguel was in Cardiff at the time when he came up with this idea, and I was also at Cardiff. Uh, in the office opposite him. And while he was doing that, I was playing Tetris. And the, the last laugh is on him because I was a really good Tetris player. Um, but he had this really nice idea. Okay, and Sonny White yesterday described it quite well, so I'm not going to go into it, but essentially you've got your Star Trek Enterprise at a nice flat space time. You scrunch space in front of you, expand it behind you, and away you go. Problem, as Sonny explained, is that you need this annulus of material. His graphic calls it uh, exotic matter. It's actually negative mass energy density, and it's not clear that that means anything. It's not meaningful. It's not antimatter, which is positive mass energy density. It's negative um, mass energy, it violates a condition in, in general relativity that m makes me think it doesn't make much sense. Other people will draw the line differently. But after Miguel came up with that idea, it was battered backwards and forwards in the pages of this journal, and um, just about 18 months ago, Eric Lentz, a German physicist, he claimed... Oh, sorry, I didn't see that. Um, he claimed to have come up with what he called hypersolitonic um, configurations that were sourced by positive um, mass energy densities, in which case it's an engineering problem, not a physics problem. Don't know how to do it, but in principle you could build a warp drive. But a careful analysis shows that, again, you need this negative uh, mass energy. So that doesn't work. A few months after that, Bobrick and Martire came up with a, a nice paper uh, analysing warp drives and, and, and showed that you can build a physical warp drive with purely positive mass energy densities, but it's subluminal. So it's consistent with the laws of physics, probably not with economic laws, um, and it's not going to get you to the stars any faster, even if we could build it. And this last one is is not actually anything to do with warp drives. I just want to show you the sorts of things that get discussed in that journal. And I'm giving this as a freebie for the science fiction writers uh, in the audience. <clears throat> There's a great panel discussion last night. Um, Arthur Eckert, an Oxford physicist, and his colleagues showed that th there's a problem with um, superluminal observers and in, in special relativity. It doesn't play very well. But they showed that in one plus three dimensions, superluminal observers, that, that's fine. We live in a universe of three plus one dimensions, which is a bit of a problem. But for science fiction writers out there, if you want some sort of hand-wavy, superluminal um, travel, there you go. So as Sunny pointed out, we have wiggle room here. We don't fully understand how quantum mechanics plays with general relativity. So there's wiggle room, but I'm going to say that warp drives are preposterous, okay? They're not going to get us to the stars. But I think even at sub C, we can still disturb the universe with this Stapledonian mindset on. So I'm going to give a, a, a scenario that sounds preposterous, but it isn't 
in the sense that it's consistent with the laws of physics. And there are many models in the literature about this. And I'm just going to look at one. And I do it for two reasons. First of all, I've, I've spoken with Anders Sandberg, one of the co-authors about this, and it takes a sort of logical endpoint to it. It's about intergalactic spreading, not just interstellar spreading. Okay. And it's called eternity in six hours. I'll explain what the six hours is in a minute. And it's based on two assumptions. Okay. If nature can do something, then the same thing can be done under human control. And any task that can be performed can be automated. Okay. Now, when you transfer that into technological language, it can sometimes sound a bit strange. You know, an acorn's just an acorn. You don't think twice about it. But if you say it's a small five gram package that develops into a self replicating solar powered machine that synthesizes carbon dioxide, rainwater, and produces oxygen and a robust building material on a planetary scale. That sounds weird, but it's what an acorn is. So the Armstrong Sandberg model, first of all, you dismantle mercury. Okay. It's, it, 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 it's just engineering. It's, um, so, so this is following a scheme, um, proposed by Robert Bradbury, but not not the other Bradbury, this is a different guy. So you put a solar farm on, on Mercury. You use some of that material, uh, some of that energy to move material from Mercury. That material is used to create solar captors. You use that solar energy to remove more material. And then you rinse and you repeat. And then nothing much happens for about 25 years with this um, approach. And then with about five years, Mercury disappears. You've disassembled it. Okay. Step one. Step two from that, you make a Dyson sweet sphere or a Dyson swarm is a, a better word. Probably should be called a Stapledon sphere because Dyson uh, was heavily influenced by, by Stapledon here. Essentially, it allows you to capture the sun's output. So you've got access to 10 to the 26 watts. Okay, and at that stage, you become a Kardashev type two civilization. Okay, we're currently not even a Kardashev type one civilization. We're about 0.75, something like that. You develop self replicating probes. Now, this paper, it's, it's full of hand waving. You sort of take off the amount of hand waving you do. Ask Alex up the top for details of, of self-replicating probes, but essentially you've got a replicator, which need not be massive. You need some deceleration mechanism because you're going to be sending these things out to the stars at high speeds and you don't want them to become kinetic bombs. So you've got to stop them. And, uh, Anders considers antimatter and fusion and fission rockets. There are other options. I think that you might want to consider magnetic sails perhaps. And you'll need data storage and AI and other bits of equipment. In their paper, they assume no shielding um, and they rely instead on, on redundancy. You're going to send out lots and lots of these things. Okay. And read the, 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 the paper for the range of options that they give. So having done that, what you're going to do is use about six hours of sunshine. It's all you need to launch about a billion of these probes out into space. A again, how you do that is left as an exercise for the reader, you quench guns, lasers, particle beams, whatever. Um, and the figures I'll give here that we're sending these probes out at 0.8, um, C and again, read the paper for a range of considerations. And they're sending these probes in a directed fashion and pro programming the replicator to do the stuff once they reach other systems. Again, they're going to dismantle something, create Dyson swarms, send more of these things out. And in two or three generations, you can reach all the stars in the galaxy. And, and maybe somehow biology follows. And then a second 
wave of colonization. They're doing the same thing, six hours of sunshine, and sending these things out to other galaxies. Okay, at all point eight C. And the colonization time in that situation is just dependent on the travel time to the galaxy. It's, it's not the colonization of the galaxy. What you do after you've done, after you've used 12 hours of sunshine, what you do with the rest of it, I don't know. But the result on that model, if you survive as a species for about a million years, you can spread through the galaxy. And on a time scale of about a billion years, you can reach a decent portion of the, the local universe. So I'm not saying that is a plausible model, okay? I'm not even saying it's a preferable model. I'm not saying that's where we want to get to. And I'm not saying it's a priority for society, but sub, sub elements of society might eventually think they'd want to do that. But it's not impossible in the way that I would argue a warp drive is impossible. So two follow-up questions. Would human society bother committing to such a long-term project? And if so, why? Why would you want to do that? Well, we do commit to long-term projects, and we always have done. All cultures have done so. And if you were a master mason um, starting out with the European cathedrals, for example, you knew you wouldn't live to see the end of the cathedral being built, your son wouldn't, your grandson wouldn't. I'm still committed to doing those building projects. Why would space be any different? And I'd argue that life should propagate through space for a variety of different reasons. Um, on, on Monday, someone raised the, the, the first mover, a game theoretic advantage, you know, colonize to stop other people colonizing. People of a certain age might remember Hill Street Blues. It was one of my favorite TV shows. And Yablonsky, Sergeant Yablonsky, let's do it to them before they do it to us. I, I always preferred Sergeant Esterhouse. Let's be careful out there. That was a nicer philosophy. But that game theoretic, do it to them before, before they do it to us, might appeal to some people. Or some elements of society might want to spread a message, a religious idea, a political viewpoint, or it's a hedge against existential risk, either self-inflicted or imposed on us. And I think it's great to see ethicists talking about this, Joseph Gottlieb um, asking these should we type of questions. You know, I think we need the precision that philosophers can bring to this sort of discussion. And I'm by no means um, a philosopher, but I've been talking with um, a, an Italian ethicist, Luca Busapio, who's interested in the ethics of astrobiological um, discoveries or non-discoveries. You know, what happens if we discover it's just us? You know, how should we act? And Luca's argument, and I'm not going to go into any detail, but the principle of survival at any cost should guide our actions. You know, if we are alone, we're responsible for preserving, protecting life. Uh, a few years ago, Stephen Dick, um, a well-known name in astrobiology, formulated what he called the, the, the um, intelligence principle. Maintenance, improvement, perpetuation of knowledge and intelligence is the central driving force of cultural evolution, and that to the extent intelligence can be improved, it will be improved. And I'd like to propose a modification, it will be improved and it will spread. Because I, th I think a universe that can have thoughts is more interesting than a universe that can't. You know, sentience is interesting, more interesting than rocks. So I'd, I'd argue we have a duty to spread out through the universe. Now, whether you take that sort of airy-fairy intelligence principle stuff that I've just said, or that hard-nosed, do it to them before they do it to us, I think there's lots of reasons why we might expect to want to get out into the universe. 
But that then has a paradoxical aspect, doesn't it? It's Fermi's question, where is everybody? I, I probably don't have the, um, the time to go through this cartoon, but anyone wants to know the story of where the Fermi's question came from, I'm happy, catch me later and I'll, I'll explain uh, what, what's going on in this cartoon. But essentially he was given this, um, this cartoon and he was lightning quick in his thinking you know, taken 23 minutes to get here, he looked at this and then within a couple of minutes asked the question, where is everybody? Because he realised, I think, that there is a paradoxical aspect. Uh, Tsiolkovsky earlier um, asked the same sort of question and other thinkers have thought the same thing, the same question in later decades. Because surely they should be here by all the arguments that I've just given for us I've argued that intelligence can, and I'd argue should, spread through the galaxy, and it can do so quickly on a cosmic scale. But the Copernican principle would suggest that there should be many intelligent species out there. There's nothing special is there about us or about Earth. And those species could have developed interstellar travel hundreds of millions of years ago, perhaps billions of years ago, so probes from civilizations across the galaxy should already be here. And if you follow that Armstrong-Sandberg prescription, probes from you know, a million galaxies could have reached us if they set off a billion years ago. And, and, and to my mind, that's one of the most fascinating uh, questions in science. Where are they? And, and as... Andrew said, I, 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 it's a hobby of mine to collect solutions to this. If anyone has any, please let me know and I'll add it to the collection. Before going on, I should say I'm assuming that they're not here because if they are here, obviously it goes away straight away. That's that question, the, the, the puzzling aspect of the question. So I'm assuming that Ancient civilizations did not travel interstellar space to shift blocks of stone and make pyramids. I don't think UAPs are evidence of alien craft. I think they're very interesting, but I don't think they're evidence for craft. And I think we don't need to adopt the aliens hypothesis to explain something like Aumuamua. But Others may disagree. So I want to just look at one possible response to Fermi's question. Um, because some of my colleagues argue that this is the solution. That Anurag was right, okay? That we're not going to be able to travel interstellar distances. I mean, Philip Lubin uh, yesterday pointed out the the numbers involved, and they don't look good. And some of my colleagues say, no, travel is impossible, but what species will do is try to communicate, okay? In other words, rather than sending craft, they'll send photons. And there are good reasons, obviously, for sending photons. They travel at light speed. Nothing goes faster. They go where you want. They're not charged. So they're not going to be affected by magnetic fields. Easy to produce, cheap to produce, easy to detect, easy to interpret. The senders can assume that the receivers are doing astronomy if they're an advanced civilization. So they might detect these photons and the receivers know that the senders know that the receivers know all this. So there's the possibility of a communication channel. And that, I think, that response has, has driven the SETI endeavour for the past six decades. And, and Frank Drake, who sadly passed recently, wrote, at this very minute, with almost absolute certainty, radio waves sent forth by other intelligent civilizations are falling on Earth. 
said that back in 1962. So we have traditional search for extraterrestrial intelligence, which is look for photons, okay? The theoretical underpinning developed in 1959 by Kokoni and Morrison, who pointed out uh, the importance of the waterhole frequencies. Uh, and in 1960 by Charles Towns, um, who pointed out, let's look at laser light. Uh, and I was just struck yesterday listening to Arandana's talk on high-powered lasers. I, I think Towns there was taking a Stapledonian approach because I, I don't know, but I'm guessing those first mazes and lasers were puny things. But he appreciated that you could use them to communicate over interstellar distances. Okay, so there's been no success with that SETI endeavour in the past 60 plus years. A, a recent results, um, which I found quite interesting, uh, Uno and her team uh, made a, an analysis of the non-detection results reported by Breakthrough Listen. And Breakthrough Listen was looking at certain target stars, but in the background, there are galaxies and an analysis of those galaxies seems to suggest that those K2 and K3, Kardashev type 2 and Kardashev type 3 civilizations, they're just not there. Now, of course, it's the proverbial needle in a haystack. There's lots of phase space still to explore. So that um, UNO paper I just referenced, it covered tiny fraction of the sky, limited frequency range, limited time duration, massive amounts of phase space still to explore. So there's good reasons to continue with SETI. And I think confidence is high, certainly in the UK. Confidence is high in the SETI community that we will soon make contact. And the, the reason for this, I think, is that there are some incredible observatories going to come online fairly soon. And we will already have some incredible observatories, but they're going to be more. So there's more observing opportunities. We have massively increased computing power compared to what Frank Drake had in 62. It's trillion fold increase. And there's new, new approaches. We have machine learning and, 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 and the rest of it. So the idea is that surely success is going to come soon. We'll make first contact and we'll detect radio or optical signals. Now, this has led the UK SETI Research Network to think hard about post-detection protocols. What should we do if we make that detection? Um, it's, it's a UK um, initiative, but we do have international affiliates, Catherine Denning and Stephen Dick, I mentioned. Uh, this is the webpage for the hub. Um, it's an initiative, as I say, of UK SETI Research Network, of which I'm a member. Um, it's jointly hosted by the University of St. Andrews in Scotland and Durham University in England, which has a centre for, for global law and governance. And, and people there are interested in interstellar or interplanetary law as well. And this has all been done um, on the proverbial shoestring. We're looking for some um, income from the, the research councils, interdisciplinary research councils. But this, is, this has been done in our spare time. Now, I'm going to say something perhaps controversial for my colleagues, at least, in the UK SETI Research Network. So I want to just say at this point that post-detection is worth thinking about. Absolutely it is. And I did some work um, recently 
I'm, I'm interested in the reaction of social media and um, society as a whole to what, how, how might we respond and, and how might we as science communicators get the message out there. And I'm, I'm considering what I think is a likely scenario, which is that we will make a discovery of a techno signature or a bio signature, but it will be contested. Okay. Might be a bio signature, but people might try and interpret that in terms of complex chemistry, say. Now, I absolutely agree with Becky McCauley Wrench yesterday that science should adopt a last resort hypothesis for this. Absolutely. I suspect though, that some people won't. And, and they'll, they'll get the message out there. And what happens in that scenario when it's contested? And, you know, will people be enthusiastic? Will they be cynical? Will they be uninterested? And I think we have a case study because we have Al Moore. It has been pushed by certain high profile individuals as an alien craft. And this this is a, a, a absolutely on point if true you know, this could be one of the greatest discoveries in human history okay we have an alien craft entering the solar system now back when i was on twitter and had high blood pressure and it had a functioning api um i could do stuff with this so i could um easily investigate the tweets um and the associated metadata of the tweets relating to Amuamua. So I, I did that and very briefly, just want to give you the, the highlights of, of what I found. The level of interest, at least on Twitter, was small. Okay, so in, in 41 months of data that I looked at, there were fewer than 100,000 tweets. And to put that into context, in 2019, there were about a million tweets of an egg. Nothing else, just an egg. COVID-19, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, for obvious reasons, um, orders of magnitude more prevalent. And in fact, interest in Aumuamua on Twitter, it was similar to other big science stories of the period. Okay, so it got slightly more traction than the phosphine on Venus story more than the gravitational wave discovery story, less than the Trappist system, planetary system um, story. Um, interest was global. It was niche, but it was global. So a broad language distribution, you know, 52 languages um, tweeted about Amuamua, 175 countries. If you look in terms of accounts per million of mobile internet, and the UK and Canada and Spain and Venezuela, for some reason, were, were quite actively talking about Al Muamua. The content aligned with mainstream science. Okay, so you do a sentiment analysis on the text and it was neutral polarity. The hashtags that appeared with Al Muamua were science. Hashtags in the main, the word cloud mentions interstellar object. That's what it was. Solar system, spacecraft, Harvard for obvious reasons. It wasn't connected with UFO Twitter, which is a thing. It was a separate, um, slightly different set of uh, accounts that were tweeting about Al Muamua. And the timing of the tweets, if you look at the timing, the peaks in activity coincided with scientific stories. So Green Bank was looking at um, whether there were any signals from Al Muamua. They'd write a, a, a paper, a press release to go along with it. The BBC, CNN, the rest pick up on the press release. And that's what accounts for these, these peaks. And very quickly, um, there were some fringe accounts, but they were 
shouting into the void, no followers, no retweets. But mainstream astronomers, by and large, did not engage, at least on Twitter, with this, uh, with this discovery. So I mention that not because it's necessarily interesting in and of itself. I just wanted to give my bona fides for um, what, what I'm going to say. I think post-detection is worth thinking about. But I'd be quite happy. I would not be sad if SETI continues to get null results. Because maybe my colleagues are right. You know, if SETI detects radio pulses and we find nothing else, you know, if civilizations are sending photons rather than craft, then it might imply that interstellar travel is too hard or it's too costly or it's too time consuming. So if SETI is successful, then clearly it's possible to send and receive photons. But I want that preferable cone to include civilizations sending craft. And I want one of those civilizations to be us. So we absolutely need, I think, a strong SETI techno signature, biosignature program to determine the role that biology plays in the universe and particularly the role that intelligence plays in the universe. And I can think of um, three options with intelligence. There's lots of intelligent life out there, advanced civilizations, and interstellar travel and communication takes place. Or there's lots of intelligent life out there, and only interstellar communication takes place. Or intelligent life is rare. Now course, the universe does not care to hoots about my preferences, but I'll give them anyway. Um, option one, I think, is great. That's the Star Trek universe, the Forbidden Planet universe. Option two, I think, is limiting. Because if those other civilizations have not been able to reach the stars, why should we be the ones to succeed? principle of mediocrity would just suggest that we'll be just like them and we might be able to communicate but we won't be able to travel and option three i think gives us potential perhaps it's just us i'd argue it is just us and then if it is just us and if we survive then the universe contains one species at least with the potential to reach the stars and spread intelligence across the universe. And we could aim for that preferable cone. So, the cosmos seems to contain no spacefaring species. Okay, Ob obviously observations might change that conclusion course. But does that mean that life faces hurdles that prevents it from becoming an interstellar phenomenon? Now, those hurdles, if they exist, might be in our future, okay? Climate change, war, just the difficulty of interstellar travel. But those hurdles could be in our past. All of the hurdles could be in our past. There might be lots of them, which perhaps would explain why it is just us. You know, abiogenesis, you know, the creation of life from non-life, uh, the evolution of multicellularity, uh, evolution of intelligence, the development of science, just the look of living on a planet that's had clement weather for billions of years, you know, long-term long climate stability. Perhaps that's a lucky planet. So I think we should act as if there's nothing to stop us becoming the species that develops the technology. You have the light sails and the antimatter rockets and the particle beam propulsion and all the stuff that actually we don't have a clue about, but in the future we might develop. 
we could be the, the, the species that takes life to the stars. So final slide. So interstellar travel is hard. Okay. And it might well be that the individuals here will not be around to see it happen, but the work itself, I think is absolutely vital. Couldn't be more important. Um, so I'll just end by saying, keep up doing what you're doing because it is really important work, I think. Thank you. And I've ended on 45. Interesting summary of the Fermi paradox. I just think you're a little bit pessimistic on not wanting SETI to uh, receive signals because if the reasonable hypothesis is that interstellar travel is possible, but faster than light travel is not possible, then the other civilizations that are doing interstellar travel are undoubtedly communicating uh, across interstellar distances with photons. And we could uh, overhear or eavesdrop in on those communications. Uh, Greg and Jim Benford, for example, said, uh, a photon pushed uh, sail would be the beam that pushes it would be visible for thousands of light years. So uh, maybe we can see some of these things. So don't be too pessimistic here. Absolutely. And, and just for the avoidance of doubt, yeah, I don't want us not to look. Yeah, I, I think it's absolutely certain that we do. Uh, absolutely important that we do. Uh, and I'm not at all certain of any of those conclusions, but it's just that. I would not like us to live in a universe where we can only um, transmit and, and not travel. Whether that will happen or not, we don't know. Yeah. Thank you for the lovely summary. Um, I think trying to prove that we are alone is more difficult. It's actually impossible because that means that you exhaust the entire search space. And at that point would mean that we are really masters of the whole universe, not just the galaxy, right? And I think that's impossible. Um, and that hypothesis um, or the, um, the idea that maybe we are the first civilization to emerge in the universe isn't that very similar to the great filter that has been proposed by Robin Hanson? And um, I also have a comment about the post-detection protocols. Um, so uh, it's um, a, the public, I'm part of the hub as well. So the public has been desensitized, right, over time with respect to uh, different science uh, news, right? So. Um, it's difficult to compare um, almost or likely things, you know, that might happen, might be over a certainty, right? When you do have that, um, uh, that information going into the media that, yes, we have found alien life. And I think at that time and point, at that point in time, uh, the reaction of the public will be completely different versus um, other hypotheses that will be just circulated uh, within uh, the scientific uh, community. We see this with COVID-19, right? Before, when we had SARS, we had other types of epidemics. The public was not as interested as when, oh, it actually happened and you have this pandemic and then people are reacting to these news as if in, in the context of this is actually affecting my life. It's something else when it's something out there that, you know, you are thinking, yeah, it's interesting, you know, but it doesn't really affect my daily life versus, so, and this is not just about alien life. It's about any kind of uh, major event that can have an impact on the daily life, right? So uh, there is the, that margin of between 99% of this might happen or not versus certainty, yes, this happened, that, that can wreak havoc on... Uh, on the global response. So those are my comments. Thank you. Re regarding the, the first point, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's logically impossible to, to prove um, we're alone. At some point, maybe the balance of probabilities, you would say, is that we are, if we continue not to, to make um, discoveries. And, and 
different people will um, make that conclusion or that feel uh, in different ways. Regarding the second point, absolutely. Um, and, and I think that's why the, the post detection hub work is is really important because I think we need to understand how best to communicate um, what what are quite subtle um, subtle circumstances. It, it it's very different having a, a UFO coming over the White House and hover there um, versus something that will be discussed in the scientific literature. And how do we communicate that, um, that, that scientific process? And it's, it's not just um, SETI, it's, as you said, it's, it's health-related matters and so on. I think that's, it's a really important um, piece of work that needs to happen. Garrett? Hi, nice uh, overview of the Fermi paradox. I was curious as to your thoughts on the uh, hypothesis that we're just, we're not necessarily alone, but we may be first or at least a bit early, the idea that maybe the universe has been too hostile up until uh, on cosmological timescales, everything settled out. And then it's, there's no, it's not as worrying that we don't see people everywhere because we've only had a couple, you know, hundred million years to get going. Well, well that has certainly been um, uh, a proposed solution that if, if you like, the, the clock of evolution keeps getting reset by... Um, Gamma ray bursters, for instance, just resetting um, the, the 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 clock. So it, it it's certainly possible. I haven't. I'm I'm not really convinced that civilizations could not have arisen um, in the past elsewhere. But it, it's certainly a, a a thought, yeah, and a proposed solution. So Becky, uh, thanks so much. Um, I really loved your kind of talking about time scales and lifespans and generational uh, initiatives. And I wonder if you want to speculate at all about the biases we kind of bring to these with, you know, what we think about in terms of lifespan, right? I mean, everything we're talking about is kind of based off of the average human or Earth-based lifespans, right? Whereas that's not necessarily a limiting factor on biology, right? I mean, you could have intelligence life with really short lifespans or much longer lifespans. So do you think that that would have any impact on kind of some of the things you're talking about? I, I mentioned that um, maybe we need um, advances in um, biotech and computing as well. So maybe it's not just biological um, life that we need to consider. You may, maybe our descendants will not be biological. They will have some relationship perhaps with, with us, but who's to say that, you know, some sort of silicon based life form, silicon being technology, it, it, it isn't impossible. So absolutely. What well, one of the difficulties in, in thinking about all of this is the number of biases we bring to, to the question, isn't it? I mean, we've got one data point. Um, we've all got our own um, biases, and trying to disentangle that, I think it's almost impossible. I like the idea that the, the equation is the ultimate work dog test, right? You know, if it's yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The person that's in the numbers yeah. than it does about yeah. the amount of life in the universe. Yeah. I mean, if I can just say for, for just going back to Pascal's. Um, talk yesterday, Th this idea that um, we arrived late, therefore it takes a long time to develop intelligence. Well, one bias, for example, is that maybe you need um, five billion years to develop intelligence and maybe we arrived early. You know, maybe, maybe that's just how it is. So life arose early on this planet because it had to in order to reach intelligence at this at this point, you know, if it takes five billion years, then we had to have live on a planet where life arose early, because if it arose after four billion years, we would still be not even multicellular. So, so there's all sorts of biases. Yeah. Okay. Last question to Phil. Um, you're probably um, of the age where you remember fear and loathing in Las Vegas. 
So I would posit that fear and loathing in the universe may be a follow-on to that. Um, the reason I say that is we, we published a paper in 2016 on what you could do um, with the bright light that we would use to propel things to you know relativistic speeds and some mathematical analysis is a game theory paper and showed that you know if there's one civilization anywhere in the galaxy that had what we are positing to do not too distant future hopefully uh that it could be seen anywhere across the galaxy with a simple telescope that's the size of your hand uh in a board you could cover all the stars in a board a couple of years so one thing in talking to the SETI community, of course, was, you know, a violent reaction against, you know, doing something like that, which I call the fear loathing part, right? That we have read too many science fiction books. We've watched Alien versus Predator too many times, and we are afraid to announce our presence. And so perhaps the solution to the Fermi paradox is they too are afraid to announce their, because they have read too many science fiction books, yeah, again, it's another one that I cover. Um, so it's not original, but yeah. Um, yeah, if anyone does have any others, please let me know. Okay, let's thank Stephen for uh, giving such a fascinating talk. Thank you.